when we think of Easter, oftentimes we think of Easter as something to defend. Here are five reasons why you should believe the resurrection happened. And there's plenty of wonderful evidence to give to you. There are 500 witnesses. Um, there's no such thing as group hallucinations. Um, how do you explain the disciples who were timid and hiding and then became people who turned their world upside down? How do you explain these things except there be a resurrected Jesus? So that's the evidence. We, we can talk about the evidence of, of Easter. We can also talk about Easter in terms of what happens when we die? What happens when we die? At the end, uh, we, we find great comfort, of course, in the fact that those who believe in Jesus um, will be raised with him. We find great comfort for those who uh, lost loved ones and the fact that we will one day see them again if they are in Christ. That's a great comfort to us um, because of the resurrection, because of Easter. So we think of Easter usually in those terms, and oftentimes Easter sermons are in those terms. But one of the things that we are, I believe, missing a great deal is that the resurrection is not just a reference to the end of our lives. The resurrection is not simply something to be defended, but the resurrection is now. The resurrection is here. The resurrection is for the present. When we look at the New Testament, and there are, there are some 300 references to the resurrection of Jesus, we do find how the resurrection of Jesus truly does apply in, in defense of, of Easter in the hope that we have when we die. But there are also a lot of scriptures that pertain to the resurrection of Jesus for how we live in the present. We are new creations in Christ. That's not we will be new creations. We are new creations in Christ. It's not that we will be raised with Christ. Paul says we have been raised with Christ. So there is a present reality of the resurrection that oftentimes goes kind of over our heads, or, or maybe we just dismiss it, or we kind of ignore it because we're so conditioned to think of resurrection as having only to do with the end. And maybe how we can defend our faith today. So the resurrection is now. The resurrection is now. That's what I believe Jesus is trying to convey to Martha when he says those words, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. It's not I will be. It's not you will be. It is I am the resurrection and the life. So let's look at that. Let's look at how real resurrection hope works today. How, do, how does real resurrection hope work in the present? So after receiving the urgent news about his dear friend Lazarus, Jesus makes very clear to his disciples, if you look um, earlier on in John, he says, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. Thanatos, dead. So he's, he's very much aware of the condition of Lazarus. There is no notion in Jesus to try to spin this in any way. There's no like, hey, look, look on the bright side of things, or let's take a positive um, outlook. No, Lazarus is dead. That's the reality. And the reality is that all of us, all of us, one day, it will be said of us, we are dead. One day. That's a reality that faces all of us. We don't like to hear that. We don't like to really dwell on the, our mortality as a reality, uh, especially young people. I, I find uh, uh, sometimes the middle schoolers that I teach, um, how often do they think of death? Uh, I ask them that question. And some of them are like, yeah, sometimes. Um, but the reality of mortality is all of us are going to face it. All of us are going to hear those words that one day... Um, we will be dead. But I love D.L. Moody's words where he says, you know, you will hear one day that, that D.L. Moody is dead, but don't you believe it? <laughs> don't you believe it? And, and the reason that he says that is because D.L. Moody just sees death as the scripture does. It is a pathway 
to eternal life. It is, it is life that has started today and death becomes an open door to a greater abundance of eternal life that we have forever in the Lord's presence. If any of you would like to say amen to anything I say, feel free. I just want to leave that door open to you because if there is a day to say amen, today is the day. But then Jesus says in verse 15, after he says this, he says, Lazarus is dead. But then he says, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. Boy, that's a odd, strange, unique thing to say when you tell somebody that someone is dead. I'm glad I wasn't there. I'm glad. I'm glad. Strange. Why? Why is he glad? He's glad he did not intervene prematurely to save Lazarus from dying. He's glad. If he's glad, there must be something greater at work than Lazarus's physical death that would make him glad. So what, is, what did Jesus mean? He meant that Lazarus's sickness did not have physical death as its ultimate purpose. And he goes on to talk, talk about that. Jesus was helping his disciples in this moment understand suffering understand suffering, that bad happens, bad things do happen to people who believe in Jesus. Um, if anyone tells you otherwise, if anyone tells you that, oh yeah, believe in Jesus and all the bad things will go away, don't, don't believe it. That's another gospel altogether. But what we do see is that the disciples are being helped by Jesus to understand that resurrection and life are in Jesus even in the face of suffering. And this will take their faith to another level for them to expect that we can see resurrection even in the midst of suffering. That's relevant for us today, isn't it? That we can walk into our city and we can go into any place, the Tenderloin District. We can see homelessness. We can see just how how upside down a lot of things in our city are, we can walk into all of those places and say, yet there's hope. We can see resurrection. We can see the power of Jesus in the midst of everything that's broken. Um, that's what Jesus is trying to take their faith to, take that faith to another level, because that's not where their faith is. Their faith is nowhere near that, right? We see that in Thomas's words. What does Thomas say? Well, after Jesus says that, he says, let's also go that we may die with him. <laughs> um, that's not Thomas being a valiant martyr. Um, that is Thomas kind of like Eeyore, right? Uh, well, this probably is not going to work out very well for any of us. So let's just go and die with him, right? That's what Thomas is at. That's where his faith is at. His faith is not quite at that place of being able to look into the face of suffering, into the face of brokenness, and still see the resurrection. But that's where God wants our faith to go. That's where he wants us to go. So, Lord, oh, what, what is Martha? Say? If you had been here, Martha says, if you had been here. Oh, we've had those thoughts, haven't we? When you've, when you've seen someone who's dear to you and they face a, a cancer diagnosis or they go through some difficulty um, in their marriage or they pass away, haven't we said those words? Lord, if you've only been here, if you'd only been, we've had those thoughts. God, where have you been? God, when are you going to intervene? Um, Martha was right there. Martha was fresh off of the loss of her brother and, and that is her mindset, her mindset of faith. Her faith in Jesus is, if you could have been here, you could have helped us avoid this suffering. And oftentimes that's where our faith is. Lord, we believe in you to help us avoid the suffering. Get rid of the source of suffering. Get rid of this cancer. Get rid of this problem. Get rid of this. And Jesus is, if we watch, we will watch Jesus nurture Martha's faith to the point where she, her faith will be able to do something more than that. To say, not just, Lord, get rid of the suffering, but 
Help me see the resurrection in the midst of the suffering. So what does is, what is Martha say? She says, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, Jesus has taken her faith, bumped it up a little bit so that she can look back in the scenario of her loss and in the midst of her suffering say, Jesus, because you're here, I know that anything's possible. Because you're here in the midst, anything is possible. Now, what does she know? She didn't know really anything. She didn't know what kind of outcomes that would mean. She didn't really understand that, but she was leaving all the scenarios open, leaving all the possibilities open. That's what she means, whatever you ask, whatever. Jesus could ask for anything, and that means that anything is possible. So when we walk into suffering, what we, what we need to do, number one, is our hope, resurrection hope, unites with Jesus. Our resurrection hope unites with Jesus. That's what Jesus is inviting her into. Because when she says those words, Jesus takes Martha from where her faith is at and tells her something unfathomable. Lazarus will rise again. Lazarus will rise again. She didn't ask him for that. Right? She just said, whatever you ask... I know it's possible. And then Jesus said, here's what I'm asking for, that Lazarus will rise again. If Jesus says it, then you can bank on it. If he says it, you can bank on it. But our approach in faith is, Jesus, whatever you ask, everything's possible. Anything's possible. So I'm going to walk into this suffering like anything's possible. I'm not going to walk into this suffering to limit you or what you can do. Sometimes we do that. We say, God, we, we know this is tough. This is hard. Um, and so I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you to do that hard thing. That's just a little unreasonable. You've done a lot of hard things already. We don't, we don't want to presume that you would do anything. No, whatever you ask, meaning I'm going to walk into this hard thing and leave it up to you. Leave every possibility on the table until I hear you say, this is what I'm going to do. And when we walk into any kind of situation, united with Jesus, with Jesus, then we are listening to what he is saying. And sometimes you will hear him say, this is what I'm going to do here. And by faith, we pray that. And by faith, we walk into it. And by faith, we join with what Jesus is doing to see that happen, right? So that's why hope has to be united with Jesus not united to a particular outcome, but hope is united with Jesus so that I can leave the outcomes to him. That's why Jesus says then, as he's nurturing her faith, he's nurturing her faith so that the outcomes become less of the point and he becomes the point. And that's when he drops the line, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Unite yourself to me. Unite yourself to me. Resurrection is not a doctrine. It is a person. The resurrection is a person. So unite yourself to a person. If the resurrection is just a doctrine, then all you got to do is get your theology right. All you, all you got to do is get your mind right, think right, all of that. But if the resurrection is a person, then you need to unite yourself to him. You need to have yourself oriented relationally to Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. So my prayer is that we don't come away from this place having received a certain bit of knowledge. Because if you're going to walk into suffering, just having a bit of knowledge is not going to help you. It's not resurrection people are people who are united to Jesus and walk into the suffering saying, whatever you ask, whatever you ask, right? And we listen, we listen to what he has to say. So he then goes on to say, he who believes in me will live, even though he dies, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then asks 
this question of Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? This is the question for us. Will you unite yourself to me? Will you put all your eggs in this basket, in me? Will you put all your trust, all, we'll put all the stakes, the stakes are high, put everything that you love and dream of, put it in me. Will you do that? Do you believe this? Martha, you've lost your brother. You expected me to prevent that from happening. But do you believe me to the point that if you're united with me, that we can walk into your suffering and know that anything's possible? Her response, yes, Lord. I love that. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So Martha says, yes, yes, and goes further to press into Jesus for who he is for her in the midst of her loss, who he is for her in the midst of her suffering. And Jesus takes that. Jesus takes that level of faith and moves with it. Martha didn't have, still didn't have complete understanding of, of Jesus and what he came to do at that point. This is still before the cross. This is still before the resurrection. But the amount of faith that she has is enough, and Jesus works with that. Isn't that so good to know? All you need to know is, do you have the kind of faith that just unites yourself to Jesus and allows that faith to just keep understanding, keep growing, keep pursuing Jesus until there is greater knowledge. But the greatest thing for you to do is just unite yourself to him and just walk with him and let him reveal himself to you as your journey goes and then let him ask whatever he wants. Uh, Brendan Manning said this in, a, in his book, Abba's Child, Quote, for me, the most radical demand of Christian faith lies in summoning the courage to say yes to the present risenness of Jesus Christ. That is the greatest demand of the Christian faith, to say yes to the present risenness of Jesus Christ, meaning, yes, you are alive, yes, you're with me, and yes, I'm going to unite myself to you, and that's enough. That's everything. So that's what hope does. Resurrection hope unites with Jesus in the present so that we can walk into the suffering. But here's the second thing. If you unite with Jesus, your hope is also going to suffer. Hope is willing to suffer. And that's the second point. Hope unites with Jesus. But secondly, hope suffers. We move now to Mary. Mary has been in the house. She's been mourning. She's overwhelmed with her grief. But when she hears that Jesus is nearby and, and is actually beckoning, beckoning her to come, she doesn't wait. She goes. She goes to Jesus. She's united herself to Jesus. Remember, this is Mary who would sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teachings. This was something that Mary had already been in practice of. She'd already been in, uni in unity and oneness with Jesus. And so for her, her instinct just kicked in. Yeah, if he's coming, I'm going. I'm going to him. I'm going to him. She doesn't wait. She presses in. There's no big confessions from Mary. There's not much dialogue. She's still clouded in her grief, but she brings her brokenness and her grief to Jesus. That's what we are to do as well. Because we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. Believing in the resurrection does not divorce us from the realities of our broken world doesn't divorce us from the homelessness in our city, doesn't divorce us to the realities of racism in our nation. It doesn't divorce us from the realities of the atrocities that are happening in Ukraine. Hope doesn't, hope is not an escape. Hope is actually the most reality-based thing that we can do because hope means that I can walk into any of those broken situations and know that there's hope, know that this doesn't have to be. It's so reality-based to be hopeful 
Jesus, if you notice his reaction, sees her crying, sees her brokenness. And what, is, what does Jesus do? Sees her and then Jesus weeps. Hope has this freedom to lament. Hope has this freedom to grieve. Because hope understands there's something that can't be taken away from you. Hope understands that you've been given heaven, and that can never be taken from you. You've been given Jesus, the resurrection and the life, and that can never be taken away from you. And so because you know those realities cannot be taken from you, that means you're free to grieve. You're free to lament. You're free to to look at the sufferings and the darkness of our world and, and bemoan it and lament it and grieve and cry and weep. You're free to do that because you know that that darkness does not have the last word. That brokenness does not have that last word. Evil does not have the last word. Death does not have the last word. Sin does not have the last word. You can look in the face of it and say to it, you do not have the last word. Because I have heaven. I have Jesus. I have resurrection. I have life. And so I'm going to look at you, darkness, and I'm going to confront you. And I'm going to respond to you. And I'm going to weep. You know, we heard on the mountain, uh, Pastor Toby talking about Nelson Mandela's belief that real hope begins with disillusionment. Disillusionment, which doesn't sound intuitive, if you think of it. Disillusionment doesn't seem to go with hope. But he said, hope begins with disillusionment. We need to be disillusioned so that we can let go of the expectations that we place on things in our world. Let go of our expectations that we have in our government or our institutions or our politicians or the people that we just wish would do better. We need to let go of it, be disillusioned by them so that we understand where our real hope comes from. And we can start to envision a new hope, envision, imagine something that can be actually better than what it is. It starts with disillusionment. Lament, hope laments. Hope gets disillusioned. And hope suffers. Hope suffers. This is, this is part of what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. In verse 10, he says this, I want to know Christ. So I'm united with Jesus, Right? I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. What Paul wants to do is he wants to be so united with Jesus that it allows him to go into the sufferings of Jesus and experience the brokenness of Jesus But he does so saying, I am going to walk into this brokenness as a resurrected person. And as a resurrected person, that means I'm going to speak truth against injustice. I'm going to put myself down and forgive the person who's done me wrong. I'm going to love people who seem to be unlovable. I'm going to turn the other cheek. Now, if you do any of those things, you're going to suffer, right? You do any of those things, right? That is what people of the resurrection do. But if you do those things, you will suffer. You will suffer. People will be offended by you when you practice those things. People were offended with Jesus, too, when he practiced those things. So don't... Don't be in denial, right? Right? We just follow our master. What happens to our master will happen to us. But we know something, that we can do those things and heaven won't be taken from us. Resurrection won't be taken from us. Eternal life will not be taken from us because we are with Jesus. We are with Jesus. So really, what do we have to lose? <laughs> what do we have to lose? You know, even, even Paul, when he in 2 Corinthians 4, you know that passage where he says, you know, I'm... 
I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm crushed, but I'm not wiped out, right? You know those, that passage? You know what he says at the end? He says, all of this is true. I'm depressed, but I'm not giving up. Why? Because I know Jesus, God will raise me up in the end, and I will be with him. See, he can't be taken away from you. I can be depressed. I can be crushed, all those things, because I practice the resurrection. I'm going to get suffering for it. And that's okay, because in the end, I'm going to be raised. What God did to Jesus, God will do for me. And God will do for you. And so that allows me to live in the present, in the reality of that. In the reality of the fact that one day I will rise just as Jesus rose, allows me to suffer in the present. That's what hope does. Hope suffers. Hope grieves. Lastly, Hope seeks restoration. So when we're united with Jesus, we lament, we grieve, we look at the darkness and the brokenness around us, but then we don't just stop there. We seek restoration. We look at that brokenness and we reimagine what would it look like for the resurrected life of Jesus to show up in the Tenderloin District or to show up in my dysfunctional family or to show up in the, in the workplace situations I'm in, wherever. What would it be like if the resurrected Jesus showed up in this place? Well, here's the thing. The resurrected Jesus has shown up in those places. You know why? Because he's in you. <laughs> he's in you, right? The hope of glory is Christ in you. So you are carrying the resurrected presence of Jesus with you wherever you go. You have been raised with Christ. It's not just a future thing. You have been raised with Christ. You are a new creation. You are a new person. Sometimes we wonder, if, oh, Lord, why don't you do those signs and wonders that you used to do in the early church? And we wish that some, we hear about it in Africa, we hear about it in all these other places, but why don't you do it here? You know why? Because you're the sign and wonder. It's you. You've been raised from death to life. Isn't that a sign? Isn't that a wonder? Aren't you a walking miracle of the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah, right. Pregnant pauses, right? That, that's just open, fertile space for amens right there, okay? So yes, you and I are the signs that there is a resurrected Jesus who has brought the resurrection into this world today. And it's giving the world a glimpse of that full resurrection, that full restoration that is going to happen when he returns. We are giving, you and I are walking witnesses of the resurrection to the world around us that one day Jesus will fully realize when he brings it all down and brings his kingdom all the way down. Oh, gosh. You know, the, the issue I have sometimes is when I lead worship and then I have to preach, Sometimes in the middle of my preaching, I want to go back here and lead worship because I'm in this place right now where I just want to just say, thank you, Jesus. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for resurrecting me. Thank you for translating me from darkness into life. Thanks for changing my home address from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That happened. That's me. That's you. If you're in Jesus, have you forgotten that? When you look in the mirror and you see all the havoc that happened the night before on your face, in your hair, and you try to clean all that up, can you in that moment look at yourself and say, I am a sign and wonder of the resurrected Jesus. In that moment, in that moment, because look, I mean, if you're going to walk into any darkness or brokenness in our world, if you can't look in the mirror and see all the brokenness that's happening there and see the resurrected Jesus, how are you going to go down there and see the resurrected Jesus? You have to see it in you. 
I am a new creation in Christ. That is your identity. You know, that's your main identity. Your main identity is not that you're a wretched sinner. That's not your main identity. Some of you are living in that identity. I'm a wretched sinner. I'm, I'm God's brat made holy somehow because he obligated himself to do so. That's how some of us see ourselves. That's not how God sees you. He sees you as a newly created person in his son, Jesus. And because of that, then you can go into any darkness, any brokenness, anything that's been marred by evil. And you can say, I can imagine the resurrection happening here. You know why? Because it happened to me. If it can happen to me, then it can happen here. So that's what hope works for. Hope seeks to bring restoration and seeks to, to build peace. We're peacemakers. We're people who, who allow people to, to, to burn us. And then we turn around and forgive them again and again and again. Why? Because we are the resurrected people of Jesus. We are his people. That's what, that's what hopeful resurrected people do. We practice the resurrection in ways that the world can say, ah, if that's what's coming, then I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that. N.T. Wright says, the resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. It's really true. You and I are embodying that resurrection so that everyone can see, oh, it's launched. You know, everyone can look and see. God had this project called creation. And, he, and then it blew up. Sin happened. The fall happened. And the question is, did God give up on the project? You and I are the answers to that question. God has not given up on the project called creation. God is in the process of recreating his creation. You and I are the embodiments of the witnesses of that recreation work. You and I. You and I. Now, you've got to believe, first of all, if you're going to, if you're going to bring that into your world, you've got to bring, bring that into your world, this world of you. I am a new creation in Christ. That's what it means to live in the land of the living. You are living in the land of the living if you are living in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That makes you a new creation. You're alive. You're alive. So look, we can look at our world and bemoan the fact that it seems to go from bad to worse. Sure. We can complain and grumble about our politicians and about our institutions. Sure. But... If we're going to live as resurrection people in our world today, between Jesus's resurrection and our future resurrection, then we are here to be witnesses of that resurrection and bring hope into the brokenness of our world. Let's not be the people who complain about our world. Let's not be the people who grumble about it. As if we're surprised, oh my goodness, the world is this bad? Come on. We know that God can take the worst and turn it around. Why? Because he did that for us. He did that for us. So look at the worst around you. Look at the world around you and look right in its face with Jesus, with Jesus, united with the resurrection and the life. And you look at that world and you say, this is wrong. This is wrong, and you grieve it, and you weep with those who weep in it, and you, you groan like creation groans. But creation's groaning in, in anticipation that the sons of, re, of redemption are going to be revealed, and that's you and me. Creation is waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God. That's you and me. Let's reveal the resurrection today as creation groans. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you'll help us not just to believe, 
in the resurrection, but to practice it, but to put it into play in the world around us, into the brokenness, into the sufferings around us. Help us to practice resurrection so that, it, so that our lives would bear witness to the fact that your kingdom has come, that you have not given up on this project, but Lord, you're in the midst of recreating it. Lord, help us to believe that we are already recipients of this recreating work, having been made new creations. Lord, help us to believe that. Help us to believe that even when we're at our worst, that we are still new creations in Christ so that we can be bold in our witness in our world today. So Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that the resurrection is not just a future reality, but it is here. It is now. Help us to live in the power of your resurrection today. In Jesus, your name. Amen.